The unprovoked Russian invasion of Ukraine continues. The information space related to the war in Ukraine has been dominated by the Pentagon leaks in the first half of April, at a time when the Russian offensive is fading out without much to show for it. While Ukrainians are preparing but sending mixed messages about their counter-offensive. Welcome to another update on the Russian invasion of Ukraine, covering the first half of April. And whether you're researching sensitive topics like the leaked government documents, or you just want everything the web has to offer, then use the special offer from this video's sponsor NordVPN at nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals. If it can happen to the Pentagon, it can happen to you. There are endless ways for your information to end up in other people's hands, perhaps just for their profit or perhaps to actively bring you down. Either way, you'll want NordVPN's encrypted connections blocking any data theft. NordVPN actively prevents you from being attacked moment to moment too by blocking viruses, malware and online tracking software through their threat protection system, which is great whether you're browsing casually or surfing on the front line of an ongoing cyber war. But if that's all too heavy, NordVPN has a lighter use. Link to any of their huge selection of speedy servers all over the world and use their regional IP addresses to access region-locked content on loads of TV and gaming services, getting you extra value for money. From seeing the Russian perspective on the war to watching an old sitcom that doesn't run in your country anymore, these servers are a great option to have. Start today and get a discount with our special offer. Go to nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals and you'll get four months for free when you buy a two-year plan. They offer a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk in giving it a try. That's nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals. Bakhmut continued to be the main target of Russian assaults in this period, as Wagner mercenaries continued advancing inside the city. By April 2nd, they took control of the city's destroyed administration building. By April 14th, Wagner reached the main train station of Bakhmut. As of April 15th, Russia controls some 80% of all Bakhmut, as the Ukrainian defenders have been pushed out towards the city's west. To the north of Bakhmut, the 106th Air Assault Division expanded Russian control around the MO3 highway towards orokovo vesolivka This proves the claim of Prigozhin that the sole focus of Wagner in the Bakhmut section is the city itself, while the regular Russian army units, including its airborne forces, have been deployed to solidify the flanks around the city as a potential insurance against the Ukrainian counter-offensive. On April 5th, Zelensky stated that the Ukrainian defenders would be ordered to withdraw from the city if there was a risk of their encirclement. According to the Pentagon leaks, which we will discuss in detail in the future, this almost happened on February 25th. At the time, the chief of the Ukrainian military intelligence, Kirill Budinov, assessed the Ukrainian situation in Bakhmut as catastrophic, as Russian forces were closing in on the T0504 highway, the only supply line controlled by the Ukrainian army. It seems like the Ukrainians have been able to push the Russian army slightly away from the T0504 highway to stabilize the situation, but this supply line still remains under fire control of the Russian army. In comparison with Bakhmut, the Russian advance around Avdivka has been negligible. The 114th Motorized Brigade's capture of Novobakhmativka, north of Avdivka, was confirmed in this period. By April 9th, they advanced westward and took a portion of the H-20 highway under their control. The Ukrainian 71st Jaeger Brigade conducted a minor counteroffensive on April 5th and liberated areas northwest of Novoselivka. There has been some criticism by the Russian military bloggers of the usual human wave tactics or meat assaults as they are calling them, used by the Russian army, now in Avdivka. But that is not news at this point. The Russian army has also achieved minor progress on the North Luhansk front. On April 5th, the Russians gained some ground towards Torska. On April 7th, the 144th Motorized Division recaptured several positions between Novoselivka and Kuzimivka. On April 14th, the Ukrainian 81st Airmobile Brigade lost some ground to the Russian Bars battalions southeast of Bilohorivka. Russia has been attacking on the North Luhansk front since February, but despite minor gains, they have not reached any of their objectives, including capturing Liman and destroying the Ukrainian bridgehead on the eastern bank of the river Oskil. 
Not being able to turn around the situation on the battlefield during this offensive, while losing more of its offensive potential, will be a major problem for Russia. To the point that Russia, which has long been perceived to have an unending reserve of tanks, has started deploying the Stalin-era T-54-55 tanks, along with losing more men. The Russian government is currently enacting measures to ensure a continuous flow of cannon fodder to the battlefield in Ukraine. Head of the prisoners' rights organization, Russia Behind Bars, Olga Romanova, claimed on April 8th that the Russian army is signing 18-month contracts with inmates willing to join the army. On April 11th, the Russian Duma adopted a law to increase the effectiveness of the military draft. According to this new legislation, the draft summons will now be sent digitally, while all eligible people will be included in the digital register. Summoned citizens are banned from leaving the country. Failure to report to military conscription offices within 20 days of a summon leads to a cancellation of driver's license, blocking of bank accounts, loss of state benefits and other problems, including losing property rights. This may indicate that Putin is preparing for another round of mobilization. Realistically speaking, mobilization is the only major tool of escalation that Putin still possesses, outside of the use of tactical nukes, which is extremely unlikely. While the ongoing Russian offensive indicates that poorly trained Mobics are not an effective offensive force, they can still be useful for defensive action if the Russian command accepts Prigozhin's advice. The Wagner chief says, the ideal option is to announce the completion of the special military operation and tell everyone that Russia has reached the results it had planned for. Prigozhin suggested focusing on solidifying and defending Russian gains instead of seeking to capture new lands. He is the first prominent member of the Russian elite who spoke out in favor of wrapping up the war, but Putin's rhetoric so far indicates that he wants more. China's military support to Russia might have been a game-changer for Russian chances of success in Ukraine, but at this point, this looks increasingly unlikely. On April 5th, the Chinese ambassador to the EU, Fu Tsong, called the no-limits status of the Russo-Chinese relations a purely rhetorical statement, and declared that China does not recognize either Crimea or other annexed territories of Ukraine as part of Russia. On April 14th, Chinese Foreign Minister Qin Gang stated that China would not supply Russia with weapons. This contradicts the recent information about the Chinese delivery of rifles to Russia. But rifles are not jets, missiles, drones or tanks, and Ukraine can probably breathe easier about the potential military support of China to Russia in this war for the time being. Along with that, as we have earlier reported, the pace of missile and drone strikes by Russia on the Ukrainian civilian infrastructure has decreased dramatically. On April 4th, Russia launched 17 Shahed drones on Odessa and Mykolaiv blasts, 14 of which were shot down by the Ukrainian air defenses. Russia launched seven S-300 air defense missiles on Slovyansk on April 15th, which killed at least 11 civilians. Ukraine still does not have an answer to S-300 missiles used in this unconventional manner. But the good news for Ukraine is that Russia does not launch its cruise missiles on its energy infrastructure as much anymore. While in October, Russia launched cruise missiles on seven different occasions, and in December on six different occasions, this has decreased to just one attack in March. There have been no cruise missile attacks on Ukraine in April as of April 16th. As a result, Ukraine has been able to restart the export of its surplus energy. The Russian economy continued experiencing significant problems in this period. The Russian Ministry of Finance's figures from the first quarter of 2023 show 2.4 trillion rubles of budget deficit. At this rate, Russia may expect 9.5 to 10 trillion rubles of budget deficit for 2023. Oil and gas revenues have decreased by 45% due to dropping prices and the loss of the European energy market. Budget expenditure has increased by 34% or 8 trillion rubles, a third of which is related to secret articles. This probably means war-related expenses. Since June of 2022, the ruble has lost about 35% of its value. The Russian government will have to find ways to reverse this trend if it intends to continue fighting in Ukraine without risking an economic collapse.
The opposition towards Putin amongst the Russian nationalist circles is brewing too. On April 1st, a group led by the former separatist DPR commander and FSB colonel Igor Gherkin, who was found guilty of the 2014 downing of the MH17 airplane, created the Club of Angry Patriots. They have stated that their goal is to prevent the Russian defeat in the war in Ukraine. In recent years, particularly after the start of the war, the Putin regime has strongly cracked down on liberal and leftist opposition in Russia, while the nationalist circles enjoyed relative immunity. It will be interesting to see whether the nationalist opposition to Putin leads to anything meaningful. Another bit of interesting news from Russia was the assassination of the prominent Russian military blogger Maxim Fomin, also known as Vladlen Tatarsky. He is mostly known for his We will defeat everyone, we will kill everyone, we will rob everyone we need, everything will be as we like, quote, he said during the celebration in the Kremlin. Tatarsky was killed in an explosion during an event he hosted in St. Petersburg in a cafe belonging to Prigozhin. The Russian government has already blamed Ukraine and the beleaguered Russian opposition without any evidence. At this point, there are numerous indications of Russia preparing for the Ukrainian counteroffensive. According to the Ukrainian general staff, Russia plans to evacuate those willing to leave Zaporizhia and Kherson oblasts. They are also building fortifications along the front, including Crimea, particularly in the Zaporizhia oblast. Satellite images show a 70-kilometer-long trench there. The Ukrainian army officials claim that Russia has 113 battalion tactical groups in the Zaporizhia oblast, which means there are at least 56,000 and possibly as many as 113,000 Russian soldiers to defend this area. The fact that Ukraine has made several HIMARS strikes on the Russian military infrastructure in Melitopol and other areas of the Zaporizhia oblast in this period may also indicate that they intend to counterattack in this section, as expected. According to Ukrainian officials, the Ukrainian army has already created eight brigades of the Assault Guard to participate in this counteroffensive. These Assault Guards will assist regular units of the Ukrainian army, which is going to employ 200 to 400,000 troops in this counteroffensive, according to Prigozhin. On April 4th, the Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister Vereshchuk called on the Ukrainians living in the occupied territories to leave as soon as possible. So there has been a lot of evidence that the Ukrainian army is on the brink of counterattacking, but it looks like the rainy weather in this period has delayed them. There may be some other causes of delay of the Ukrainian counteroffensive, like waiting for the delivery of pledged tanks and armored vehicles, or perhaps the Pentagon leaks, which we will discuss in a second. Budinov has assured that the Pentagon leaks will not impact the counteroffensive, and that the result of the Ukrainian action will be seen very soon. On the contrary, Prime Minister Shmihal stated that Ukraine would be able to launch its counteroffensive in the summer. The contradictory messages of the Ukrainian officials about the timing of the counteroffensive may be a deliberate attempt to confuse the Russian army, or may signal a lack of consensus at this time. We shall see. Meanwhile, weapon supplies are being delivered to Ukraine as we speak, and the Allies have made more pledges in this period. On April 1st, Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki announced that Ukraine ordered 100 Rosomak infantry fighting vehicles from Poland. Later, Ukrainian President Zelensky informed that Ukraine would get 100 Rosomaks immediately and 100 more later. It will be paid for from the joint fund created for the needs of Ukraine. In this period, Poland also delivered eight MiG-29 jets along with pledging six more. On April 6th, the Ukrainian military industry giant Ukrobaronprom stated that they are starting the production of 125mm tank rounds with a Polish weapons producer. They will also cooperate to maintain a maintenance service for T-64 tanks. On April 3rd, it was reported that Denmark and Norway had made an agreement to send 8,000 artillery shells to Ukraine, while the Netherlands pledged 270 million euros of support mostly for humanitarian and non-military purposes. On the following day, the US announced another military aid package to Ukraine worth $2.6 billion. It included munitions for Patriots and NASAMs, ammunition for HIMARS, artillery shells, mortar rounds, TAU missiles, and more. 
A notable addition is the CUAS laser-guided rocket systems, which the United States is sending to help Ukraine get a cheaper solution against Shahed drones. The Pentagon also announced on April 5th that it had signed a contract to manufacture M1A1 Abrams tanks for Ukraine. On April 6th, it was reported that Germany delivered an engineering vehicle, eight Zetros trucks, six recon UAVs, and rounds for automatic grenade launchers. Czechia also pledged 30 million euros worth of military aid to Ukraine, while Denmark promised 100 Leopard 1A5 tanks. On April 12th, Spain confirmed its intention to deliver six Leopard 2 tanks and 20 armoured personnel carriers by the end of April. In this period, we witnessed several curious diplomatic developments. Let us reiterate that Ukraine and Russia do not appear any closer to substantial negotiations at this point. But for the first time in a while, a top advisor to Zelensky informed the media that Ukraine is open to a diplomatic discussion about Crimea if they reach the peninsula's administrative borders and achieve their other strategic objectives on the battlefield. This may be the first signal of interest of Ukraine in diplomatic talks since April 2022, but it contradicts Defense Minister Reznikov's statement of April 9th that Ukraine will only hold talks with the next leader of Russia. This has been said before by Zelensky, and it looks like the general attitude towards negotiations with Russia remains unchanged. Another notable diplomatic event was French President Macron's visit to China where he held talks with Xi Jinping. We're not going to talk about Macron's statements about Europe's autonomy vis-à-vis -vis the United States, since this is not our topic. We will stick to the war in Ukraine, regarding which both leaders made important statements. Xi Jinping talked about the inadmissibility of using nuclear weapons and China's interest in a political solution to the war, while Macron called on Xi to bring Russia to its senses. This meeting demonstrates that China intends to continue on the path of a neutral actor with regard to the war in Ukraine, while France seeks to act as an independent player and not just another member of the Western coalition. Now let's talk about the leaks. Throughout April, several images claimed to be classified documents from the Pentagon were leaked. Most of them were about the war in Ukraine. We will have a video specifically dedicated to the Pentagon leaks soon, for now, we will briefly talk about their immediate impact on the war in Ukraine. The immediate reaction of Russia was that this was an American disinformation campaign. The immediate reaction of Ukraine was that this was a Russian disinformation campaign. But very soon, the Pentagon confirmed that the first batch of leaks reflected genuine documents, while some others had been altered. Several leaks offer the Pentagon's perspective on casualties on both sides. One document estimates up to 17.5 thousand Ukrainian KIA and 43.5 thousand Russian KIA, with total casualties assessed at 124 to 131 thousand for Ukraine and 189 to 223 thousand for Russia as of February. Another leak claimed that Russia has lost 90 to 95 percent of the special forces of the GRU, the Russian military intelligence. These figures are more or less consistent with what has been claimed by US officials in recent months. Interestingly, another document on the casualties soon emerged on the web, which looks like a poorly photoshopped version of the one we just talked about, and claims that up to 71.5 thousand Ukrainians have been killed during the war. Another document indicates that Russia enjoys a manpower advantage on the Kherson, Zaporizhia and North Luhansk fronts, while in the Bakhmut section, there is parity between the sides. These figures probably do not account for Ukrainian reserves in the rear, including those being prepared for the counter-offensive. Otherwise, it is impossible to explain this manpower disparity. The Pentagon leaks provide information about the weapon situation of Ukraine as well. For instance, it is reported that JDAM guidance kits effectively strike targets with precision, but are somewhat vulnerable to Russian electronic warfare tools. The Ukrainians are advised to destroy those tools with artillery prior to using JDAM. Another report is about the depletion of S-300 air defense missiles by Ukraine. According to the document dated February 23rd, Ukraine will run out of S-300 air defense missiles by May 2nd if they continue using it at the same rate. Book air defense system missiles may run out by mid-April. 
there are several interesting leaks about the diplomatic aspect of the war in Ukraine, particularly attempts by Russia to purchase weapons from abroad. According to one of the leaks, the Egyptian president el-Sisi agreed to produce up to 40,000 rockets to be covertly delivered to Russia. Egypt has since refuted this claim and reiterated its non-involvement in the conflict. A US government official speaking anonymously confirmed that they were not aware of the execution of this plan. Another leaked document states that China approved the supply of weapons to Russia early in 2023. This document is consistent with the statements of American officials from February and March, in which they strongly warned China against selling weapons to Russia. The available data since February 2023 does not indicate the provision of weapons by China to Russia. Several leaks talk about the infighting inside the Russian elite. According to one of the leaked documents, the Federal Security Service of Russia, which is basically the heir of the KGB, has accused the Defense Ministry of hiding the true extent of Russian casualties, which are about 110,000 killed and wounded. Another report informs about Putin's attempt to resolve the conflict between Shoigu and Prigozhin, organizing a meeting between them on February 22nd, when the Wagner chief accused the Russian MOD of not supplying them with sufficient numbers of artillery shells. This part is very plausible, since Prigozhin has indeed put brakes on his very dismissive attitude towards the Russian Defense Ministry in recent weeks. Finally, the Pentagon believes that the war will continue in 2024. They don't expect Ukraine to liberate a significant portion of the occupied land, while Russia lacks resources for effective offensive operations. This will prompt both sides to conduct further mobilization. According to the leaks, the Pentagon assesses that prolonging the war will cause disillusionment in the Ukrainian public. As of mid-April, more leaked documents are being revealed, so we will have to wait a bit more to understand the whole scope of the leaks and their impact on the war in Ukraine. Most of the information regarding the war in these leaks has been largely known or suspected by military commentators and those who follow this war closely. Ukraine has already stated that these leaks will not impact their counter-offensive, while Russia simply continues dismissing them as a PSYOP launched by the United States. Unfortunately, we share the Pentagon assessment that the war will continue into 2024. Ukraine's counter-offensive may be successful, but it looks unlikely to strike a decisive and final blow on the Russian army to win the war in 2023. The Russian winter offensive has led to mediocre results at best, as the Russian army does not seem to be anywhere near having the potential to end the war this year. The war will continue to cause death and destruction in Ukraine, with the risk of escalating. This escalation could have happened in September 2022, when a Russian fighter jet fired on a manned British surveillance aircraft, which were saved only by a munition malfunction. Or in October 2022, when, according to the Times, Ukraine attempted to retake the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant by force. Putin does not intend to withdraw from Ukraine, while Ukraine understandably wants to liberate all of its territory. We're going to talk about the Pentagon leaks in detail in the upcoming episode. For now, let's look at the visually confirmed losses of military equipment for both sides reported by the Oryx blog. For Russia, as of April 16th, these are 1,901 tanks, 3,973 vehicles, 240 command posts and communication stations, 675 artillery systems and vehicles, 191 multiple rocket launchers, 79 aircraft, 81 helicopters, and 212 drones, bringing the demonstrable Russian hardware losses to 10,000 pieces of equipment. For Ukraine, these are 479 tanks, 1,408 vehicles, 10 command posts and communication stations, 280 artillery systems and vehicles, 42 multiple rocket launchers, 61 aircraft, 29 helicopters, and 100 drones. More videos on the Russian invasion of Ukraine are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and press the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.